So um, welcome back to um, the next session, um, session two on building in ecologically sensitive to de design. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Pip Moore. Um, I was based at Aberystwyth University, um, but are now based at Newcastle. Before I go any further, actually, we've changed the way that we're um, miking up for this session. So I've got a neck mic on. Can I just check with the people online that you're hearing me okay? The last session, there was a few issues. Um, a thumbs up, that's all good then. Excellent. Um, so um, in this session, we'll be um, talking about building in ecologically sensitive design. And we've got four speakers for that. Um, unfortunately, you have to listen to me for a little bit longer. So I'll be speaking about the evidence for biodiversity benefits and eco-engineering. Um, Kieran McNally from the University College Dublin was then going to be speaking, um, um, building on some of the stuff that Paul talked about, about scaling up some of these um, designs. Um, unfortunately, um, he isn't able to be here today, so Joe Ironside is going to step in for that. Um, and then um, uh, Dr. Matt Perkins from Swansea University is going to be giving a talk about a home for lobsters. This is one of the um, later work packages. So this is from work package nine. So this is work that is still actually being worked up. Um, so um, integrating lobster habitat into coastal infrastructure. And then Harry Thatcher will be joining us on, online. Unfortunately, he's down with the Rona at the moment. Um, and he'll be talking about um, lobster habitat use in offshore wind farms. So I'm going to go to my talk. OK, so um, Yes, um, I'm going to be um, speaking about the evidence for biodiversity benefits in eco-engineering. Um, Louise Firth gave a little bit of background to this in her talk, so I'm going to build on some of that. Um, and as Paul said, this isn't a, a, a lone show. There were many, many people involved in this. Um, there were um, Paul and Taz and, and, and Veronica who are here today, um, as along with some other people from UCD. Um, it, at Aberystwyth, um, Ali Evans um, was um, a key driver of this. Um, unfortunately, it would have been really nice to have Ali doing this talk today, but she is literally giving birth as we speak um, and decided to put that ahead of coming and giving a talk. Um, this, this project also involved um, working with engineers, so um, Kieran and Atea were really important in helping that. Um, and, and helping with some of the work as well was Peter Lawrence in terms of spatial modelling. So uh, a lot of people involved in this project. Um, just a very quick overview of this, um, because Louise talked about this in her opening presentation. Um, but there's a real been a real proliferation of artificial structures in the marine environment, um, both to mitigate against the impacts of climate change through the development of, of offshore renewables, um, and also to allow our coasts and cities to adapt um, to future climate change in terms of sea level rise and increased storminess. So we see a lot of infrastructure, um, such as riprap, sea walls, and things like that. As has already been said, these often provide poor quality habitat, um, and this results in much lower biodiversity and non-natural communities on artificial structures um, versus um, natural rocky reefs. And, um, <clears throat> and it, Veronica talked earlier about actually how also this affects the morphology and demography of um, different species as well. So eco-engineering, um, Louise talked about this. This is the idea of um, sort of trying to build in some of that habitat heterogeneity that we find on our natural reefs through doing um, intervention, interventions that um, range from small scale interventions, such as altering material design, through to, to sort of centimeter, millimeter to centimeter um, alterations, um, right up to big, large macro ha habitat units that Louise showed in her talk. So um, one of the key parts of, um, uh, of, of this eco-structured project was actually to test pre-existing interventions in an Irish Sea context, um, but also to develop new interventions and design and test those at an experimental scale. So throughout the project, we did a whole range of, 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 of factors. Um, we we tested a number of designs in an Irish Sea context, so just drill cord rock pools, um, vertipools that are, are developed by um, Art Ecology down on the Isle of Wight, um, hulas, um, which are sort of um, th these sort of rope-like um, uh, uh, structures that go around um, pylons that sort of act as seaweed. They're called hulas because they look like a hula skirt. Um, we trialled um, drilled pits and um, World Harbour project tiles, um, 
and um, also living seawalls, which are, are all um, developed by the um, re reef design. We also then um, designed and trialled new designs in an Irish sea context. So we looked at alternative um, forms of concrete. We know that cement, for instance, it has a significant um, ecological footprint in terms of CO2 emissions. So we looked at, um, looked at how different um, concretes with different um, CO2 footprints, um, how that impacted on the sort of um, species that colonised those. And we also um, developed some letterbox crevices, um, bolt on rock pools to address specific questions. We also transplanted coralline algae. We know um, from the literature that a lot of species preferentially settle where coralline algae is found. But red algae have no motile stage, so they can't actually um, um, disperse very easily. And we often find that if you're not very much close to a, 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 a natural rocky reef where you've got um, coralline algae there, that it doesn't arrive. And then I'll also um, talk a bit more about these natural topography tiles that, that um, Paul um, briefly touched on. I'm not going to talk about all of these things, um, but I picked out three just because I um, of these just because I think either they were somewhat novel um, uh, that, 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 that natural history can influence some of the things that we do, and also we're seeing, um, as Louise said, this sort of um, more and more companies coming up that are developing. Um, different designs. And I guess I, I thought that um, it might be nice to touch on one where I feel that um, the, the scientific community can sort of help to try and address comp uh, uh, some of the, the knowledge gaps we have um, by testing ecological theory. So one of the things, um, well, I guess part of EcoStructure developed out of Ali's PhD that was um, funded um, partly by KESS um, and, and, and partly um, by um, Liz Morris Webb's company, um, uh, which I've now currently forgotten the name of, which I remembered two minutes ago. <laughs> Marine EcoSol, isn't that embarrassing? Sorry. Uh, uh, so Ali, um, for her sins, decided that she would visit every artificial structure in Wales. Um, she didn't actually tell me that she was doing this until after she'd finished her PhD, where she regaled me in stories of camping next to public toilets, um, which was perhaps not on the risk assessment. Anyway, in terms of um, a lot of what we do, sometimes as scientists, we, we you know, incorporate um, other experiments and we test those. Um, we might incorporate ecological theory, but also um, one of the great passions that we have is that we probably all start, came on this journey to be a marine biologist by starting off rock pooling. And so coming at this from a natural history perspective. So as Ali was walking around these shores, um, we've got numbers of old, old seawalls that sort of have these sort of um, brick-like um, designs, which are, then have grouting in between. And quite often this grouting is the first stuff to disappear, as we can see in this pot. Well, if laser point, it doesn't work. In the top um, corner here. Um, and what Ali noticed is that these actually provide a really important refuge for a range of species, including um, very small, but a potentially eventually um, commercially important species, such as this brown crab, um, Cancer pagarus, and also perhaps charismatic species, such as fish like this little blenny. And so when people go in and actually um, go to repair these works, and they quite often fill up that, that sort of um, uh, that they point that so those those habitats are lost um, and then you've lost this habitat for these crabs and, and fish that, that hide there during um, tied out scenarios. So um, Ali came up with this sort of letterbox design um, to create these um, sort of um, habitat units that you could then fix onto a seawall as mitigation for when, when you're fixing it up. Um, she also did lots and lots of field work, um, looking at the optimal cracks that these um, um, fish and crabs were in. Um, and actually, as we speak, um, I've got a student who's currently testing these in the lab to, to do some behavioural trials looking at this. But as you can see um, here, th there's some snake locks and enemies, but um, here you've got a little blenny who's sitting there um, looking out. The really cool thing about some of these fish is they actually home to these locations as well. So they're, they're actually something that they go back to time and time again. One of the areas I think is um, academics that we can help move things forward is actually by um, incorporating ecological theory in, into the sort of experiments we do. So one of the questions that often asked by um, regulators, um, by practitioners, 
is, is how much is enough and in what configurations do you get the best outcomes? Um, these images at the top here are sort of a range of different bolt-on rock pools. So quite often on vertical seawalls, one of the habitats that you're really missing is, is, is water retaining features. Um, and for any um, intertidal species, they're fully marine and therefore when the tide is out, that's when it's, it's most stressful. From an ecological or a theoretical perspective is that we've known for a long time that habitat area and heterogeneity um, have been long known to influence biodiversity. So um, in the sort of conservation literature, um, a long-standing um, sort of thing that's been tested is, is a single large habitat that has a lot of space to support lots of species or several small habitats that may increase the amount of heterogeneity um, has long been considered in the design of marine protected areas and reserves. Um, and it's also important to have dispersal or habitat corridors um, to actually then facilitate the movement of organisms. So we um, developed um, with colleagues over at UCD these really robust, um, very impressive rock pools. Um, they were controlled for the depth and the surface area. So all of the rock pools are at the same depth. Um, and three of these rock pools equals the same surface area as one of these large rock pools. And we distributed them um, a, a, along the shoreline um, at, in Milford Haven. Um, very much thank you to Jonathan Monk for his support in a lot of the experiments that we've done throughout the EcoStructure project. So they were put on the mackerel key. Um, unfortunately, um, like with many people, um, our research was delayed by COVID. So we didn't actually get these out until September 2020. We had to hire a high ropes team um, to de deploy them. Um, and Ali had a team of people helping her as well. So these were deployed in, um, uh, in September 2020. Last um, summer, we went back um, to um, sample them for the first time. They haven't actually reached a climax community yet. Um, that's the joys of living in a cool temperate environment rather than a warm temperate environment. It takes a lot longer for um, things to colonize and perhaps also because it's an estuarine environment as well. But we haven't had, been able to address the sloth question yet. That's hopefully in either um, after the sampling we do this summer or maybe even after three years. But what we can see is evidence of low shore species moving higher up the wall. And also we can see that fish and crabs that normally wouldn't be on these sea walls are interacting with all of these pools. So um, stay tuned for the outcomes of, of the configuration experiment. But as I said, I think these are something that um, as academics, we can help um, plug gaps to help practitioners know how to um, design their eco engineering um, interventions. We mentioned a few times about um, topographical tiles. So these are three that have been developed um, on a range of projects. So the Wild Harbour project and Living Seawalls, which um, sort of was led by um, colleagues um, in, in Sydney, in Australia. And then we've got um, the, the, um, the ones up here led by the experimental um, marine ecology lab in Singapore. And quite often these topography tiles are inspired by nature um, or, or, and very much thinking about what organisms might um, want in terms of water retaining features or crevices. Um, in Singapore, Peter Todd's lab is very much driven by theory. So these were very much driven by a range of different experiments to, to indicate what is the best um, combination of different habitats to promote biodiversity. As Paul touched on, um, as part of what EcoStructure, we did a huge survey of intertidal um, natural rocky reefs and artificial reefs. Um, we did quadrat surveys. We cleared um, areas of, of, of um, benthos. Um, also, um, Tim Urbain Jackson, or oh, no, Jackson Bouet, sorry, uh, did um, an awful lot of work doing um, LIDAR. We also had AUVs. Um, and photogrammetry, which allowed us at the quadrat scale, the photogrammetry to create 3D models. One of the things that we wanted to do is actually create natural topography tiles. So um, not just be inspired by nature, but actually design um, natural rocky reefs that you would be able to put onto um, artificial structures. And so what we've got in this um, panel here is that we actually try to do three scenarios. And we try to identify um, natural rocky reefs or, or the topography of a natural rocky reef that supported the highest um, richness, um, nat natural topography that actually supported species that were missing from um, 
artificial structures, but were found on natural structures, and then topography that supported um, the rarest taxa. So based on the photogrammetry work, um, Peter Lawrence was able to develop um, 3D models. Um, and then working with the engineers at UCD, um, we were able to then um, use 3D printing um, to create these habitat units and, and, and then these that we deployed on the shore. These were very quickly colonized by um, juvenile limpets. Um, you can see um, that they were colonized by over green algae and you can actually see these sort of grazing halos um, from those, those limpets. And we're still surveying this data. Um, again, this summer we hope to go in out and get some more, but it was just quite a, a, a nice concept um, to show that actually these, um, these tiles do support increased biodiversity. Um, and, and Ali and Paul led a paper um, developing a methodology of how you can go about this. So how you can combine photogrammetry and survey work. And, you know, these days the costs of doing this sort of photogrammetry work have come down so much. Um, and then also how you can then use that information based on your own needs and desires for what you want to colonize those shores, go through biological and topographic selection processes engineering processes, and then produce these into um, topographical tiles. So um, Ironside's going to talk a little bit more about the scaling up process. I mean, his next talk, and, and Paul um, showed a slide in his talk as well. But I guess one of the key things we wanted to get out of EcoStructure is it's really important that, that the messages and the evidence base for this um, eco engineering um, is translated into evidence. We know from some of the work that Ali did in a PhD that there was a general feeling that there was a lack of evidence base. As Louise touched on, um, a lot of that evidence base is locked in um, scientific papers that are behind paywalls that many of the people we want to communicate to um, aren't able to access because of the huge cost in um, getting subscriptions. So from the very beginning, um, Ali was very keen that we um, had uh, followed an approach where um, everything would be publicly accessible and that it wouldn't die at the end of the project. I think um, one of the problems with a lot of these big projects is you get funding for, for five years or whatever, and then at the end of the project, no one's paid to keep it going. Um, so um, Ali um, got in contact with the conservation evidence team. This is a, um, a program that's run out of Cambridge University led by Bill Sutherland. Um, and what they do is they provide the synopses on every any conservation action um, for anything from terrestrial, freshwater, uh, marine. Indeed, look out next week. Um, I think there'll be a big launch of a, a video of which um, this um, work is actually highlighted with an interview with Ali Evans. Um, along, well, I don't think um, David Attenborough was next to Ali, but this film also involves David Attenborough and Yolo Williams as well. So she's up there with the stars. So I'm just going to shut up for a second, which you'll be pleased to know, um, and play a video that gives a bit more information. Artificial structures are spreading around our coasts and seas to support growing human populations and marine industries and to protect coastlines from rising and stormier seas. These structures can damage natural habitats and provide stepping stones for non-native or nuisance species to move into new areas. They also provide new artificial homes for seaweeds and marine animals. However, they often don't support the vibrant variety of marine life found in healthy and productive natural reef habitats because they are simpler in shape and can be highly disturbed by human activities. Some artificial structures can be designed to make them more like complex natural habitats, which in turn attracts more marine life. This can include rare and charismatic species or commercial stocks of fish and shellfish. We can also seed or transplant species onto structures to give them a head start. These actions are called eco-engineering. Environmental managers are eager to see eco-engineering put into practice on new and existing marine structures, but they need to know their actions will have the desired effect to justify additional time or costs and to avoid the risk of greenwashing construction projects. Ecologists and engineers around the world are working to design and test eco-engineering actions to enhance the biodiversity of marine artificial structures. Based on their results so far, we have produced an evidence-based resource to help people create and manage structures that are better for biodiversity. 
Using methods developed by the Conservation Evidence Project, we collaborated with experts and searched scientific evidence from around the world. We found 43 actions that could be taken and 176 studies reporting their effects. We summarised each study in a short paragraph describing the action and the outcomes for biodiversity. We also indexed these outcomes in a set of key messages for each action. You can download the synopsis of evidence from the Conservation Evidence website or search the online database to find the evidence most relevant to you. So, um, as I said, uh, as the, the thing said, we, um, I identified 43 um, interventions um, and here's the list here for enhancing biodiversity on marine artificial structures. But as you would imagine, when you do these sorts of analyses, you also identify gaps. So there were very few actions on subtidal structures. The tide in effects on intertidal structures really haven't been investigated. There is some, a little bit for some fish, but not very much. There was zero, zero evidence for 10 actions and less than five studies for 24 actions. This was a global analysis. So if you've got five studies, it's very hard to find, you know, delve into context dependency. So if you want to make use of this resource, um, what we've, we've suggested is that you want to determine your objectives in advance. What are you actually wanting to achieve with this enhancement? What are the limit? What? What are the limitations to your um, study? Um, what, understand the environmental context. You know, is it an exposed site? Is it, is it um, a high shore site? Um, what is preventing your structure from achieving your conservation objectives? And once you've done that, and if you think that um, ecological enhancement would help you, then dive into the conservation evidence, read the key messages, um, what were the effects previously of that intervention, were the species location context similar to what yours, so you could perhaps expect similar outcomes? Um, choose studies that are most applicable to your context. Um, read those full summaries, read the original studies. And what I would say to people who, who are practitioners or, or don't get access to papers, we always love it when you email us asking us for a paper and we're usually pretty good at sending it to you. Um, and assess the strength of evidence. Um, so if a study has only been monitored for a short period of time, then it's unlikely that, it, it, you know, it's better that the things are monitored for longer than shorter. Consider the experimental design and how they measured success. Um, and this is the, the, the booklet. You can either download it or you can access the website and we'll, I'll be leading you through this um, later on. And I, I think a number of people on the call um, are also people that were heavily involved in helping us um, do this work. So there was a large international advisory board. Um, and what I just want to finish off with is I think one of the great things about the EcoStructure project is I started working in this sort of area about 2009, similar to Louise. Um, at that point in time, um, it was very difficult to get buy-in from a, a range of different people. Um, this is um, in Milford Haven and, 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 and Natural Resources Wales and the Port of, of Milford Haven um, Authority. Have, have, have you know funded and allowed these to be put up. Um, there's also it been mentioned before the Sea Hives project. So we're starting to see this stuff rolling out, um, and that is where I will leave it.